Petra McGowan. Uh, for those of you that I don't know, I'm the project manager for the Nature Conservancy's Reef Resilience Program, and I'm going to be hosting this webinar. The speakers, I wanted you all to just have a quick understanding of how we run the webinar. We're going to start with the presentation, and then we'll end the webinar with questions for the presenters. There's two ways you can ask questions. You can chat box anytime throughout the webinar, and I'll be keeping track of the questions that come up in the chat box. And then at the end of the webinar, I will ask those questions to the presenter. Or you can raise your hand at any time uh, in the webinar room, and we can take those questions in the order they're received at the end of the webinar. So those questions, and I'd now like to introduce and um, our, and thank our presenters for taking the time to do this. So first, um, Allison Green is a senior marine scientist with the Nature Conservancy's Asia Pacific region, and her current focus is PA network design and in the Coral Triangle. Welcome, um, Alan White. He's also with Nature Conservancy's Asia Pacific program, where he leads MPA strategies and manages the USAID support for PNC for the U.S. Coral Triangle Initiative. So we're going to have Alan start. Thank you both for doing these presentations. Well, well, thank you, um, thank you, Petra. And thank you for joining the uh, the webinar uh, today. This is a, a great opportunity for us to share some of our work that we're involved in in the Coral Triangle area. This is a brief introduction. I just you know give some credits for this work. I mean, first of all, this project is part of the Coral Triangle Initiative, supported by USAID. Uh, in the Coral Triangle, USAID has a program called the Coral Triangle Support Partnership, the consortium of TNC, World Wildlife Fund, and Conservation International, working to to implement the primary sort of field work and regional scale uh, sort of technical work supported the U.S. in the Coral Triangle, which includes the six countries of, of that region. This um, particular presentation is part of MPA the thematic work at the regional scale. It's been uh, sort of part of a, um, an ongoing process to begin the development of a Coral Triangle MPA system. A ago, we had a, a regional workshop called Regional Exchange on Designing and Supporting National and Regional MPA Systems in the Coral Triangle. And this was sort of the kickoff workshop to begin to get the six countries together to look at what it means to set up a, a functional MPA system in that region. And a big part of that is how well designed the MPAs and the MPA uh, networks are in the region, and also a big factor in that is to what extent those integrate with, with fisheries objectives and to some extent climate change objectives in the region. So, sort of further on that, I think I'll let Ali uh, jump into the presentation, and uh, you know, let her uh, sort of give us give us a complete review of what uh, what this project is trying to do. Thank you. Great, Alice. Um, and I think uh, one of the important points to start with here is that even though this work has been developed with a focus on the coral triangle, it's actually applicable to any coral reef area around the world, because the information we've been assembling relates. To to all tropical um, reef and associated species. So, let me just work out how to do this. Okay, there we go. So, the primary reason we're doing this is that protected areas can achieve multiple objectives related to protect biodiversity in the face of climate change, fisheries management, and other objectives such as tourism. Us, we've tended to focus on design and marine protected areas to achieve either biodiversity in the face of climate change or fisheries management. And MPAs that are designed for one don't necessarily maximise their benefits to the others. And part of the difficulty here is the advice on how to design marine protected areas for these different objectives, while there are a lot of similarities, they actually provide different and sometimes conflicting advice and this is very confusing for field practitioners who really want to achieve all of these objectives. So what we've been doing here is to come up with a, some specific advice for people to design their marine protected areas who want to do this. 
And also, in the past, um, MPAs have always been believed to have a great potential for fisheries management as management tools, and they hadn't really achieved their, that, um, their potential in that way for, for certain reasons. And what we really try to do is try to focus in how we can maximise the contribution of MPAs to fisheries. Okay, so the other reason we want to do this is that there's been lots of really new and exciting science and new approaches that have come about in the last few years that really allow us to refine our approaches and um, improve our ability to design marine protected areas for all these objectives, particularly regarding fisheries. And that, that information uh, regarding the connectivity, the movement patterns of key species that we care about, the information showing us that size really matters, that we need to be able to protect big fish to produce lots of larvae to spill over to fished areas. And new direction regarding an ecosystem approach to fisheries where new protected areas or spatial closures or whatever you want to call them, really an integral part of this. And as I said before, they haven't really quite realised their potential in that way yet. So yes, we approached this uh, in a couple of ways. The first thing we did is we contracted a consultant, um, Dr. Leanne Fernandez, who played a lead role in rezoning of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. Dr. Leanne to do a literature review of uh, to find out what the specific advice was for designing marine protected areas for achieving each of those objectives to where the advice is the same for all three objectives for fisheries, biodiversity and climate change and where differences are and work with us to come up with a list of um, integrated principles for people who wish to achieve all of these at the same time. Now what I'm not going to talk about here today is um, tourism management which is obviously important in many places. Many objectives for tourism management are also achieved by addressing um, biodiversity objectives. So we're just going to focus on these three today. So this has been completed. The full technical report with a comprehensive literature review and um, the 15 principles we came up with is now available online and I believe that Petra is going to make that available to everyone on this call. So uh, um, completed and submitted a scientific paper which will circulate um, as soon as we can. Now is to go through um, some of the design principles. There's 15 of them. I'm not going to go through them all, but I'm going to go through some of the main ones. Uh, and I'm going to start off with the need to create large multiple use marine protected areas that include but are not limited to no take areas. For example, on this graphic here, you can see the zoning plan for Koyao Marine Area in Rajat in Indonesia. The red zones there are no-take areas and all the other colours are different sorts of zones mostly related to different sorts of fisheries restrictions. Now we start with this is that in the, particularly regarding our interest in designing marine protected areas for biodiversity in the face of climate change, um, we really focus primarily on no-take areas. Now there's a reason for that. No-take areas are by far the best way to achieve all three of these objectives actually, including fisheries objectives, which I'll talk about in a minute. But it's really important to recognise that they can't operate in a sea of destruction and that to achieve the full fisheries um, management objectives through an ecosystem approach to fisheries management, no-take areas are a critical tool but only one tool in the toolbox for um, fishery management and we need to be thinking more about how we're going to integrate these going forward. The next one, any of the people on this call who have previously been through um, MPA design for biodiversity and climate change will recognise some of these ones and uh, I'll mention them but I'll also add what the additional rationale for why they're also important for fisheries. Most important design criteria is that we need to uh, have representative examples of each habitat, preferably take areas. Now, the rationale for that is obviously 
to see different species live in different habitats, so we need to protect examples of each. Fisheries, different fishery species live in each of these different habitats. But one of the uh, most important things we need to think about in representation is how much of each habitat, what percentage. A look has been done on that recently from the fisheries point of view, because uh, in the past, People have focused on fisheries management using older approaches such as maximum sustainable yield. They realize that to have sustainable fisheries, you really need to protect about 35% of the spawning potential, spawning biomass or spawning stock to have sustainable fisheries. Now, other approaches to do that, such as maximum sustainable yield, require huge amounts of data and information that has just not been uh, is not available in many countries. So what the science has told us re in recent years is that we use protecting 35% of the habitat that species as a proxy for protecting 35% of the spawning potential of fishery species. And in, in the face of climate change, we might even want to think about protecting more of that because climate change represents a big risk to fisheries because because of habitat destruction. Working in an area where you have very heavy fishing pressure, then you need to consider protecting towards the upper limit of that range, 30 to 40%. However, you're in an area where there isn't very much fishing pressure and you can expect that a certain percentage of your spawning stock is so going to be present outside of those take areas, then release and um, protect a smaller percentage. The part is a uh, key part of it, the spreading the risk approach, which is the need to include at least three widely separated replicates of each habitat type in no take areas. The rough of that is that the coral reef systems and associated systems are really very dynamic. There's a lot of natural disturbances, hurricanes, and now with the impacts of climate change being felt through coral bleaching and so on. We need to spread our risk and make sure we're not putting our eggs in one basket and protecting one example of each habitat. We try to protect at least three and spread them out so the chances that they're not all affected by the same disturbance is risked, such that one of those areas um, survives. It can provide larvae to help replenish the affected areas. And here just shows a design that we did in Kimby Bay in Papua New Guinea where we, uh, we applied that approach. For example, on the west end side of the bay, you can see those black boxes are uh, area identified uh, areas of interest for uh, marine protected areas. And there's a couple of examples and spread out to protect the fringing reefs in that area. really critically important that we protect special places in no-take areas. And I'll just get in terms of our three objectives. The first thing is we need to protect critical areas of fisheries management in terms of spawning and nursery habitats. We also need to protect special areas for biodiversity protection, for example, turtle nesting areas or places where there's only one example of a habitat such as a remote atoll or a remote lagoon. We want to identify and protect areas that we think are most resilient and have the best chance of surviving the threat of climate change. Now, we've been um, talking about doing this for a long time through leadership from Rod and others on this issue. And essentially, it's going from being an idea to actually being applied in many places now. And for example, on the top left-hand side of this graph, there's an example from Palau where there was a major coral bleaching event about 12 years ago now where there was a lot of, most of the coral was killed off. And different colours show the rate of recovery of the communities from that. And so we have now measured the recovery of corals from coral bleaching event. And we're thinking of how we might use that in redesigning the Palau NPN uh, protected air network. There's an example of a modelling approach, and this is um, a PhD that Eddie Game, many of you might know, works for Nature Conservancy, did on the Great Barrier Reef, where he modelled the probability of catastrophic bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef, 
and aid recommendations about the conservation priority of different reefs based on that information. So this is to give you a sense that um, of a few different ways that people are approaching how to do this now. So other approaches, for example, sea level rise, where people are using modelling of sea level rise to identify and protect key habitats. And in situations where they don't have complex models like that, you can actually use a fairly common sense approach and make sure that you select mangroves for protection that room to move as the sea level rises. There's also new and innovative work happening in um, particular Lau to understand more about ocean acidification and how we should respond to that in terms of MPA network design. And I, I think I heard Rod's voice here and he's one of the people leading the charge on that. So if we think about that later, he may be able to help us with that. So next, I'm going to get into what is what, what, what is, I think mostly what's new about what we've been doing. And that is moving beyond some generalities about the need to take connectivity into account to really providing some tangible evidence um, and approaches to how to do this. So I think it's actually going to revolutionise the way in which we design marine protected areas, particularly for fisheries management. Now, we recognise that it's important to take connectivity into account in MTA design. And by that means the demographic linking of populations through the movement patterns of key species, whether it's by adults, juveniles, or larvae. Now, if you're lucky enough, as they, as in some places, for example, they're developing on the slide here in Palau, if you're lucky enough to have a connectivity model that you use to design your marine protected areas by areas that have lots of um, good physical sources. Areas, then obviously you should use that. But really, most places, 99.9% .9 of places in the world who are doing a network design simply don't have that information. The information that's arriving really allows us to take connectivity into account in a much more informed way now because we, the second thing that we did in this project is that we um, we have come up with some more information on the movement pattern of key species in coral reefs and associated ecosystems and some very specific foundation on how to use that for size and spacing of most areas. To get into the detail of that, which I think is possibly the most interesting part of the presentation, I just want to um, recap the life cycle of a coral reef fish. We just think about this and what it means for MPA network design. So in a coral reef, we see mostly the adults and juveniles swimming around on the on the reefs, as you can see on the bottom of this slide. This is a trout. When they reproduce, most reef fish produce pelagic eggs and larvae, which spend a period of time in the plankton. This species, it's about 30 days, be settling back onto the reef where they spend most of their life. Now, they move different distances in these different phases of their life history with the mood patterns of adults and juveniles tending to be a lot more restrictive than their ability to move in the plankton. They move great distances in the plankton. So scientists have suggested that we should set the size of our uh, no-take area according to the movement patterns of the adults. And then for that is that you want to protect them throughout their lives so they can get big and fat and produce lots of larvae to spill over to other areas. We should use the spacing of the no-take areas more based on the planktonic larval duration because that's the phase that will allow for replenishment of areas after disturbance. So we've this for quite a long time, but now we're getting a lot more information that will help us refine this approach. One thing to mention is why do we need to protect fish throughout their entire lives? And the reason we need to do that that is they need to have um, to start size really matters. The information that's coming out these days tells us that, for example, this is a coral trout. The size really matters in terms of how much larvae they can produce, which can then be spilt over to other areas to support fisheries. For example, a 40 centimetre coral trout in one spawning event 
produced about 350,000 larvae. The spatule, by the time it reaches 60 centimetres, will be producing 3 million larvae per event. So as you see, what we really want to do with our no-taking areas is make sure they're big enough to protect these fish throughout their daily home range so that they can get as big as possible and produce the most larvae to spill over for um, fisheries in the adjacent areas. We've known this for quite a while, but we haven't been able to apply it in the coral reef environment because we hadn't pulled together the information on exactly how far the species that we care about move. This is, so what we did here is we followed the lead of some people in California who did this work. And we, um, we had another consultant, a wonderful woman called Eileen Martha, a PhD student, asked her to summarise, to go through all the literature and, and uh, summarise how far the coral reef and associated fishes move. Now, I'll explain this figure more in a second. The reason I wanted to do this is that the literature tells us that the size of our no-take areas, we will depend on objectives with Recommended in the past, this has been one of the biggest areas of disagreement among designing MPAs with different objectives. It's recommendations for biodiversity climate change objectives being tagged fewer areas and recommendations for fisheries being lots of small areas. So the size of the no-take area will depend on your objectives. It depends on the key species and how far they move, particularly fishery species, which are the ones that are most vulnerable to fishing. And then um, we also need to consider if there's other effective protection in place outside the no-take areas. So the question is, there is no, oh, oh, let me just back up a minute and explain the figure. So if you look at this figure, you can see pictures of a whole range of fish there from coral reef to coastal pelagic to true pelagic fish. Along the x-axis, we have a summary of the scale of movement. This is how far their home ranges are. And the recommendation is that MPAs, particularly no-take areas, should be at least as big as the scale of their home range if we're hoping to protect them to dig in fat and produce lots of larvae. This, um, on the y-axis, this is organised as the most important fishery species are along the top uh, with the other species, some of which are aquarium fish, along the bottom. So what this allows us to do is to go beyond saying, making general statements about we need to think about this, to having very informed discussions with governments, communities and other partners and people who are interested in MPA network design. And really great because in the past, because that some species move long distances, like you can see on the right hand side of this figure, some species have very large home range of ranges of you know more than 10 or 20 square kilometres. So if we didn't have more detailed information, we said well to be on the safe side, to protect biodiversity in the face of climate change, to protect all of these species, we better have big take areas because if there's protection for them outside, that's the only way we're going to be able to protect them. Now, still really good advice, and if that's something that you can do, then I definitely recommend it. Fortunately, the reality in many places in the world is that that's simply not feasible. The same time that we've been making the recommendations for the big MPAs, the fishery people have been recommending that Better fisheries are, are frequently better if you have lots of small ones because you do want some spillover, some fish to swim out of the areas where they can be caught. So what this figure allows us to do is to be this specific and to talk to stakeholders about what fish they care about and what options they have for protecting them, whether it's protecting them in the areas or whether they need to consider another approach to fisheries management. So let's take a couple of examples here. Let's say, example, we go to a community and we talk to the people and we say, what are you interested in protecting? Let's say, say oh, we like to eat parrotfish. Lots of parrotfish are very good. Um, if 
you look at the figure, if you follow the 0.5 kilometres square, so 50 hectare line up, you'll come to number fish number 18. And that the majority of parrotfish don't move very far at all. So if you have lots of small no-take areas, you're probably going to do a pretty good job of protecting them so long as you still achieve that percentage representation of their habitat. There's one parrotfish. Unpaired parrotfish, number 27, if you look between 5 and 10 square kilometres, that moves up to 7 or 8 kilometres a day. So if you want to protect that species, you've got two options. You either need to have larger no-take areas, but if your only option is to have lots of small ones, we need some other way of protecting it through fisheries regulations or policy or so forth. This allows us to do is really refine our approach to to suit local conditions, to suit what species people care about and what their options are for protecting them. To maximise, for example, the contribution that no-take areas can make by making sure they're big enough to protect the species that they care about. The other stuff we want to talk a bit more specifically is about spacing of no-take areas. So the information that's been coming out about the, remember I said before that spacing should focus more on larval dispersal connectivity. A lot of the information that's been coming out in recent years has really shown that um, whereas even though there's a potential for fish to move a long way in the plankton, and yes they do that, they have a lot of recruitment back to the local area where they came from. With enough species that they've been studying now using direct measurements through DNA, parentage and other ways, they're finding that 20 to 60 percent of the fish actually come back to where they started, most within five kilometres. So the recommendation here is this is actually good, there's lots of room to move, the spacing should be anywhere from one to 20 kilometres, more towards the smaller size for recruitment, remembering you want some widely space for your risk. This is just a, the figure you can just see here is a, from something that was done in Kindy Bay on Nemo showing that the babies that originated from um, that arrived in those areas that you can see there, 60% of the babies came from by the Kindy Island, uh, originated from there, and up to 12% arrived in another area. So it's actually empirical data that shows that those design criteria actually work. Areas that are less than 20 kilometres apart do have um, input of larvae from other areas. Actually, they've actually been extending this to studies of uh, more commercially important fish species such as coral trout and there'll be some really exciting papers on that coming out soon. But basically they do much the same thing. You just remember is that that some species, not only coral reef species, don't only live on coral reefs, that throughout their life cycle they actually move to other habitats, such as this red emperor from the Great Barrier Reef. They spawn on the outer reefs and, through, and then at their planktonic phase they drift in shore, they settle down and live in seagrass beds and then move back out to the reefs. So also if we want to protect these species we also have to make sure that we're protecting that sort of connectivity for those species. And I'll also summarise the information on in those, which species use different habitats that we need to think about. So once again, we're going beyond a general approach, such as we've been saying with this slide for a long time, to be very specific, well, which species do this, which habitats do they use. The last point I want to talk about is the duration of no-take areas. It's really important because the, essentially um, different species have different degrees of vulnerability to fishing and they recover at different rates. So when we talk about we need to protect 20 to 40 percent of habitat in no-take areas, what we really need to achieve biodiversity, climate change and fisheries objectives for species is to protect those who have 20, 40 percent of habitat in long term preferably permanent no-take areas. The reason for that is if you look at the bottom left of the slide, you can see many species, for example herbivores in this region, are less vulnerable to fishing and they recover faster once, once area is protected. A 
and there's a, a graph and data there from um, Brian Stockwell's work in the team showing that once an area is protected, the herbivores will recover pretty quickly within about three to four years. But if you look on the graph on the right, this is data. Uh, this is some data from uh, Gary Russ and uh, Professor Alcala from Apoa in the Philippines, and show that the recovery of predatory fish can take more than 20 years. So the take message here is that if you want to protect the fringe of species biodiversity reasons or for fisheries reasons, they really need to be in place for long term, preferably permanently. There are other reasons why you might want to have shorter term protection in no-take areas that are perfectly balanced. For example, you might want to um, add an additional buffer for change impact. You have short-term seasonal closures for fish plantation sites. Or in places, for example, in Melanesia, people like to protect um, areas for a couple of years and then harvest the um, increased biomass of fish, either to sell it or for a feed. Now, those are perfectly legitimate approaches, but they're no substitute for permanent long-term native areas for achieving fisheries biodiversity and climate change objectives. Okay, last thing I want to mention just quickly is that we have to, of course, remember that we have to keep doing all the other things, pivoting destructive activities and minimizing local threats. For example, here's some recent data coming from the big cyclone we had in Australia recently, the green plume along the coast is turbid water after a big cyclone. So to, uh, remember that we still need to address other threats such as runoff or design our marine protected areas to work on that. All of this, I think, is really great news for MPA network design, particularly for community managed marine areas which tend to be small in nature. And that's because we now know that no take areas, even small ones, can provide local benefits because they protect the sporting stock that provides recruitment to the local fisheries, provided they comply with the principles we've described relating sizes and the percentage area protected and so forth. And the data we've got really allows us to work with people to make sure that they're designed in a way to maximise the benefits for the community. So just up, where are we going with this now? We're in the process of refining and publishing this work. Um, the size and spacing stuff, we've just got a whole lot of, we've had it reviewed by a lot of fish experts and we're refining that. We're producing communication products for governments, policy briefs, field practitioners and field communities. And particularly that figure of how far fish move is it seems to be going viral. People love that and they love that it gives them a way to have an informed conversation with stakeholders about their, their no take areas. We're already applying this information at multiple scales scales in the Coral Triangle and beyond. As Alan mentioned at the regional coral triangle level we've been discussing this but also to MPA designs at the national and sub-national level. At the moment, we're, in, we're using this information in about 10, 10 MPA networks in about six countries. The other thing which I see is the way forward is that we need to improve our integration uh, within an ecosystem approach to series management to maximise the contribution of no-take areas to um, protecting subsistence and artisanal fisheries and contributing towards the food security of people in the region. That's it. I hope that you have a good sense now where we've been going with this. I think there's been some excellent work over the years about how to design areas for biodiversity protection in the face of climate change. Unfortunately, when we speak to this, a lot of stakeholders, we get a lot of pushback because their primary interest is fisheries. What we've tried to do now is to come up with a package that will allow field people to address all of these things simultaneously. So that's all from me. Um, perhaps I'd hand it back to our other host now and see if there's any questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, great presentation. And I want to ask now for questions. Um, if you have a question for Alan or um, Allison, please raise your hand on your little chat box and I can call on you in order of those questions. So um, go ahead and 
if if you I hope everybody can see that function and go ahead and raise your hand and I will take questions. And people are doing that. Um, I'll start with one question. Um, Al mentioned that it is being applied across, across different scales right now. Can you expand on that a little bit and give us some more details on where it's being implemented um, on me on a small scale? If, if you have an example of a community that's actually starting to use it, um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about a specific example of how it's being used. Okay. Um, well, I think the, uh, one of the more recent examples was uh, some work that we were in doing in Indonesia. Where, um, uh, we're talking about applying this at, at multiple scales. Uh, one thing that we I presented this information recently to the government in Indonesia, which is responsible for doing the 3.5 million hectare Sabu Sea uh, Marine Park, which is the largest marine park in uh, the Coral Triangle. So I've been talking to them about this and how to use and apply this information. And it's so funny, every time I put up that figure of the fish, it's like everyone suddenly wakes up and sits forward. They, they love that information, yeah. including these very senior government people. At the same time, um, when uh, looking in to support Conservation International, who are doing a MPA network design for Bali, so we spend a bunch of time going through each of these. What we what we do is when it's uh, for a specific place, what we do is we come through the general principles and we go through each one in detail and see if it's relevant to what they do and how they might apply it in that place. So we've done that with the Conservation International people in Bali, and with support um, both Scotsons and others, we've also been helping this um, Marley, who's working with the community Padaido in Padaido up. In um, the TED in Indonesia, uh, applying it to a community based approach. And I believe Scott's also using and applying this to the design of Nina Kona Santana um, Protected Park in Timor Leste. And it's so been applied. We, we had a meeting with early this at University of Queensland, and they've used this approach for the largest, no, uh, largest sorry, marine park in Sabah, in Tuma Safa, uh, Malaysia. The national government of Malaysia have invited me to go and help them present this information and help them apply it to a national network in Malaysia. And that's just a few of them. Great. Thanks. Any others from any of our in attendees? <coughs> Not sure if somebody's trying to talk or if it's not coming through. Can you hear me, Pedro? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Other questions from attendees? Well, after Ali, do you have anything else you want to expand on for the group? We have a little bit more time on our webinar. If Alan spoke a little bit about how the Philippines have been really focused on this sort of stuff for a number of years and the success that they've seen with the some small areas. Yeah. Yeah, just a bit. I mean, of course, we welcome your questions on this as you know, much as possible. But in the inside, there's been quite a lot of interest in MPAs over the last 20 to 30 years, and many of them are quite, quite small, but they've been driven mostly by interest in managing fisheries. Actually, when they've seen these guidelines come out, you know, they've sort of reinforced some of the things they've been thinking about for a while because there have been a number of experiments going on there which have documented the, the relative impacts of small MPAs on fisheries and what works and what doesn't work and in relation to biodiversity conservation. So, you know, it, it's neat to, to put the package which begins to address some of their questions. And now hopefully we can take this to some of the larger scale MPAs and some of the other countries where they really haven't, you know, come more the biodiversity, fisheries, and climate change objectives in a fairly integrated and cohesive uh, manner. I'd be interested in, you know, any uh, responses from uh, some of you that are working in other parts of the world where if, to what extent this may be applicable in, in some of your work if you have questions on that. I have a couple questions coming through, Alan. So, first, uh, Maurice okay. Knight, do you have a question? 
hear me? Yep. Yep. Uh, thanks, Allie and, and Alan, for going through this. It's very good. I'm right now in Kuala Lumpur at uh, an EAFM regional exchange where a lot of the principles for EAF on EAFM are being discussed, and, and things that came up yesterday um, about these principles that is that it appears, and I I'm just curious to, respond to this, is that these principles will take everything and put it into MDAs, and there are some comments saying there is a next maybe a step. That doesn't take away from these principles, but that there's another step to talk about true integration, what it is, uh, rather than trying to take EAFM and CCA and put it into MPAs that would really elevate everything to an equal le level. Um, and again, this is among the fishers. <laughs> that's, that's good. Uh, this is among a fishers group. So I just yeah. was curious how Can you respond to that. Any comments? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Al. I think you know, absolutely. The, like the out, we came from this with how can MPAs contribute more to the other thing, but we're now realizing that the MPA people are embracing it, loving it, running with it, but it needs to be addressed in a totally different way to fit in with fisheries approaches. And in fact, that's why Andrew's there talking about it because we mm -hmm. we know from a fisheries perspective, the MPAs are only one. One tool, and, but we're saying is, is that this is how you can maximise the benefits from that tool if you choose to use it. And I think, for example, the figure that shows how far things move it provides more informed information for people to to decide what do they want to use, depending on what fish they want to protect and how far it moves, whether no areas are the best tool or some other fisheries approach are the best tool. I think you're quite right, and I think the last point I made was we need to do a better job of integrating this in fish. A meeting that you're at where it's being presented is our first go at really trying to do that. So I would go back and say we totally agree, and that's what we want to work with them on. Fantastic. Thank you. Great. I have another question. Um, from Fielding in Hawaii, and she's okay. asking, is there any specific advice on tourism? Do you want to add Alan or shall I? I'll get off and I'll add. Okay. My, this is something that has come up a, a few times, and it's obviously a bit of a gap in what we've done. There are a couple of ways to um, think about this. In terms of tourism management, and what tourism, tourism wants to see. They want to see healthy, resilient ecosystems and lots of big fish. So in many cases, um, designing marine protected areas for biodiversity protection in the face of climate change will provide systems that are good for tourism. So that's one piece of it. And that's why we didn't put it out. And also because we knew that the fisheries was the biggest gap. The other thing is, in terms of um, specific information about um, tourism infrastructure and where it should be located um, in terms of coastal development or structures out on reefs and so forth, I do think that there does need to be a, a specific set of instructions for that and look out how to integrate this. So I, I think, am I right? That's something we, we need to develop more and um, we, we are going to do that. To add to that, um, there are several uh, guidance documents developed over the last few years in Southeast Asia, particularly Philippines, looking at the tourism with respect to integrated coastal management and MPAs, and certainly at the interfaces and how to minimize impacts of tourism in those areas. But also my experience, as Ali says, I think the thing tourists want to see is a healthy reef, and they want to see a lot of fish or fish biomass, things like that are quite attractive. Now, ways that people can visit those areas without having you know, any significant impact, I think, is important for tourism. And the win-win situation for communities where they want to generate revenue through tourism and at the same time conserve their their, their coral reef resources or other coastal resources. And then really uh, good examples of tourism management of particular yeah. sites, for example, in the Great Barrier Reef. If you'd like to know more about them, I'd be happy to yeah. direct you to that. 
Yep. All right, I have another question um, from Deb Makawa. Um, do you, I don't know if it's like, do you want to ask your question, or is it a group in Hawaii? I'm not sure. Here. Okay, hold on. Let's see if we can get Are it. Are we there? Yep. Uh, yep. Hi. Okay. Yep. Hi. Hi, Ali. Um, this is, I'm sitting cozily with the Hawaii team down in the meeting Yay. room. Um, I, the way you I thought, you know, size matters, as you say, but size matters in many different ways, mainly because big enough is sometimes way too big from the perspective of local people. And, and so the, we introduced it, and um, MPAs as multi, large multiple use areas, as well as no-take areas, and distinguished between those two, I think is important. And it's unfortunate that the perspective or the position of MPAs as no-take areas, which has developed over the last few years, has taken us away from the original sense of an MPA as any area under management. This goes a little bit towards Maurice's point, too. You know, but so you, have, you can have large areas that are managed for multiple use with fisheries, no areas playing a, a, a role in that, uh, areas set aside for tourism and so on. And I think that over time, we're going to need some kind of companion volume which really looks in depth at this issue of what an MPA is and what the side implications are to clarify that. This, there still seems to be a lot of confusion. And um, I think, based on the last year, sort of traveling around and looking at bleaching and, and MPAs and so on, and different patterns, that size bigger is better. And the reason for that is the one that you pointed out, and I, so I want to emphasize it for those who listened to everything you said. This issue of, of risk spreading or rep representation and replication and um, there, the patterns of certainly in bleach and the patterns in response to heat stress are changing a lot. And so you have susceptible species that are surviving better than the resistant species in some areas. And the, you know, there's real confusion of patterns happening out there. And, mm -hmm. and so I, th I think that in order to get those, you know, those different patterns, cap, we're also going to think of size as a mechanism to get change and accommodate that phenotypic plasticity that we're seeing expressed in some of the corals. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a good yeah. point, and I think um, I, I did focus a bit more on um, the small stuff, but um, the recommendation that we have for the size is actually to apply um, minimum sizes and a variety of minimum sizes. So I do think that in terms of biodiversity in, in the face of climate change, bigger is better. In terms of fisheries and um, the design of fisheries for the spillover, sometimes no, smaller ones can contribute more to that. So that's one of the ones where we, we recommend a mix of the two to try and get a better balance of achieving both objectives. But again, sorry, there was another point I wanted to make. Um, you talked about the length the duration of MPAs. And if you think in terms of the climate change role of MPAs, if you think of including refugia for climate change, in other words, those areas that are have high resilience, and yep. those areas are going to be the refugia that produce the light to help replenish other areas, then yep. then then you know then permanence is what you one should be aiming for as opposed to short term closure. That's a good point. I'll add that to my notes. But I think our recommendation is permanence uh, when, whenever possible. Yeah. 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 Um, I have another question for uh, either one of you, Allie or Alan. Uh, okay. Our attendees uh, wants to know, is there information, either experiences and data, that can show the fish benefits of MPAs? Um, feel like okay. the presentation. Yeah. So, where yeah. where can we direct people for those examples? I think the summary right now is the PISCO document, which is, summarizes the benefits of no take of MPAs, particularly no take. Um, 
So perhaps we can provide it on the as a helpful resource, but if you use all the sites of marine reserves, Pisco, as my yeah. summary there, and I believe they're in the, about to update that and and do a version that's more specifically focused on tropical areas. Have we got some Pisco team there, Sarah? You're there. Do you want to say something? I mean, there's a number of papers that have been published in the last five or six years that document fisheries benefits. Yeah, I can share uh, Alan, if I can, if I can get, um, I'll I'll follow up with you, Alan, to get a list of those, and then we can send them okay. to people as sure. well who are interested. Okay. I have one other question as well before we wrap up. Um, where can managers find more information to help guide them on the use of this approach? I have anyone. Uh, well, first of all, the, a summary document of this approach is being and is being the right now is sort of the uh, practitioner's guide, which will be a very kind of user friendly and graphic, uh, you know, portrait of how to take these these guidelines forward. So that'll be out within the next six months. I think probably going to be. Otherwise, these two re, the reports that I, uh, you know, mentioned are are available online, and they're complete reports. They have all the information. Great. Great. All right. Do we have any other questions? Um, we like to stick to time of our webinars so that everybody can continue on with their days or evenings. And um, I think. That's everybody's hand that I see up. Um, well, thank the panelists again for the presentations and taking your time to do this. And thank you all for attending. If you have any follow-up questions, um, please feel free to contact us at Reef Resilience. And we will be doing fear webinars over the rest of this year, so stay tuned. Um, and I hope you'll keep attending and helping us find ideas for different ways that you managers and practitioners will find useful and informative. So thanks again for attending. And um, that's all I have to say. Allie or Alan, do you have any closing remarks? Like yes, yeah, thank you for organizing and thank you everybody for yeah. for chatting and, and please know that you know we're accessible. If you have any further questions, um for Alan and I'll be happy to help yep. if we can. Yep, please and people find it useful to use the PowerPoint to speak with their uh, stakeholders, I'd be happy to provide that also. Great. Thank you. And I'll find the link uh, that we had for the report as well for everybody. Okay. Well, thanks, Ben, everyone. Thank you, Alan. All right. Thanks very much, everyone.